You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBGive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBgive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator and your one-stop source for information on giving and reports on the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor, your host, and with me today is Meskaram Brahani. Meski is the practice manager for the Urban Resilience and Land Global Practice in Africa at the World Bank and based here in Washington, D.C. She heads a multi-billion dollar operational portfolio and leads policy engagements, technical assistance, and analytics in the urban development, disaster risk management, and land covering 12 countries in Eastern and Southern Africa. Prior to this, she was practice manager for urban and disaster risk management for West and Central Africa and program leader for sustainable development based in Nairobi, Kenya. She's also worked as senior urban specialist in East Asia, with a focus on China, Mongolia, and Vietnam, and in the Middle East and North Africa. Her areas of focus include urban service delivery, infrastructure improvement, housing, informal settlement upgrading, and community-driven development. Meski has an abiding interest and commitment to social inclusion and equity. Born during her time as a doctoral student at the University of Chicago, where she spent 18 months conducting field work among a formerly enslaved people in the informal settlements of Nouakchott, Mauritania. She sees herself as a citizen of the world, having lived in Paris, Bamanko, Nairobi, Nouakchott, East and West Jerusalem, and New York, among others, and having worked across the Middle East, Asia, and Africa. And she's fluent in five languages. Meski, it's great to have you with us today. You are truly a citizen of the world, and we want to get into some of the great work that you've done to help people and nations around the world today. Thank you, Art. It's great to be here. Meski, I'm just digging into your background, and I am just fascinated by all you've done the last 10 years, literally all over the world in places like Kenya, Vietnam, different parts of the African continent, particularly in East Africa, but also West Africa. You've even spent time in Mauritania. There's there's so many places you've been in 10 years. And what I hope we're able to do in this interview is take some of our listeners along with you as you do your work and really give them sort of a ground floor look at the important work you're doing to help countries, to help people become more sustainable, more resilient from disaster, to better utilize the land and opportunities that they have, and to also discover what the world is doing to try to support them. But let me start, first of all, with a little background on you. Obviously, you've been around for more than 10 years. What were you doing that led you to a career with the World Bank these last 10 years? And and particularly, what was it that really got you interested in international work? Let's see. I, I would like to start maybe from where I got my initial ideas behind an international career. I'd say my dad was an agronomist and he worked on breeding different kinds of crops, especially corn and sorghum, and trying to find ways for producing food that improves the quality of life for people around the world. So I saw him really working in you know many different countries and trying to 
improve people's livelihoods. And that was something that always inspired me. So I was very interested in doing international work, but I really wasn't the type to work on agriculture or, or the sciences, really. I was fascinated by, by people. And so when I went to graduate school to get my PhD, I was at the University of Chicago, I had an opportunity to study international development. It was in political science, but I was very much interested in how society, people, communities can affect the ways in which their states are built and the ways that the states are are governed. So I did field work in Mauritania for my PhD. I spent about a year and a half working in an informal settlement in the capital of of Nouakchott. And I saw at the time that there were people migrating from the rural areas because their sources of livelihood, many of them were pastoralists, had you know basically disappeared. And they were settling in informal settlements all across the city and living in conditions that were, you know, didn't have any running water, didn't have proper housing, didn't have access to education. They were very far away from their sources of employment. But at the same time, these communities had a way of cooperating, helping each other, and bringing about change. And I also saw how in this context that if the government really was able to support them, they can really catalyze the energies and the knowledge and the skills that people have regardless of their income or their education level. So so that was really what got me when I was, you know, spent a year and a half there listening to people, observing how how much they suffered, that I could perhaps work on urban development issues and try to bring about change at a at a global scale from you know that experience. That's fascinating. Meski, you mentioned urban development and in the context of developing countries that may be a concept that's a bit different than what we come to know it as here in the United States. How do we really define urban development in a developing country? And what are some of the differences between what they might consider development and what we're talking about here? Basically, urbanization is a process by which you observe cities, agglomerations growing. So you have more and more people who are living in a, in a settlement as opposed, and then their livelihoods are derived more from, from trade, from the service industry, or it could be from industrial type of employment, but it's work that's quite removed from say the agricultural or the rural you know, economies where people are deriving their livelihoods, say from farming and production of, of food. And so what we've seen actually all across the world, is countries become middle income as they, be, as they have at least 60% of their population that are living in urban areas. So there's actually no country in the world that has become middle income without urbanizing. So that, that percentage of 60% of the people living in urban areas is a really critical trigger to seeing economic development occur. So if you look at the United States, for instance, we actually primarily, we're a highly urbanized country compared to, say, Kenya. And we've seen this in in East Asia as well, where you saw the Chinese economy grow very rapidly as people started settling in urban areas. And the benefit of that is that you have the agglomeration effects where you can bring people together, ideas together, they create or industries also can leverage each other's expertise. You have more trade and all of that, you know, fosters economic growth. So we want to make sure that in developing countries that we enable the countries to grow economically by also drawing on the skills and the economic potential of the people who live in cities. Wonderful. Meski. How have we done so far as a globe, really, in helping nations move from the cycles of poverty that many of them have 
to becoming more sustainable and developed? Are there examples of nations that have gone from a situation of needing external support and financial resources and other kinds of resources to maintain themselves to becoming more financially and economically viable? Are there examples of nations that have done that that you're aware of? Oh, yeah, definitely. If you look at the East Asian example, and if you look at, uh, for example, Korea, Mm -hmm. Korea in, in, say, in the 40s and the 50s, was actually at the same level of economic development as many of the countries in Africa. And, And some of the countries in Africa actually had a higher GDP than Korea at the time. But what we saw there is that they were able to benefit from urbanization was a big part of it, actually, where people moved from rural areas to urban areas, they had industries, they had more rationalized ways of thinking about their uh, their land allocation systems. And all of that helped to contribute to the economic development. Of course, they have very good policies also that allowed people to live in these uh, well-planned cities that they made better use of their existing land. They also made a lot of effort in improving the condition of people who are living in what you know today would be called the equivalent of slums or informal areas and, and upgraded the quality of, of life and basic services in those communities. And that sort of paid off over the, over the long term, because what you start seeing is that as, as, as soon as you start planning cities and as soon as you start putting in the infrastructure, a lot of that is there to stay for for generations. So if you don't put in the right infrastructure early on, you could get stuck with bad infrastructure for a long, long time. And if you do it right, then the benefits of that accumulate for generations to come. Sure. Meski, when I think about the challenges that countries have developing sustainably, I think about how difficult it is for people in general to change. And I'm wondering if there are any cultural barriers that stand in the way of moving toward a more urban type of living environment that you've seen. And how do you deal with those kinds of issues when you're trying to, get, I guess, get people to a place where they can, can actually be more urban? I mean, what's exciting about urban areas, I mean, around around the world, especially when countries go from rural to urban, through this process of rural to urban transition, is that people come from all over a given country. So they become dynamic. You have people bring in different skills. People bring different cultural perspectives. And all of this intermingling of people and ideas brings about change in, in values and change in the way that people have perceived the world prior to their arrival. And it is that dynamism that creates both not just economic development, but also brings in new ideas so that people can conceive of a, of a different a different world. And that helps to break down some cultural barriers that might have held people back because of the exposure to new ideas that come from various parts of not just their own country, but you also have mingling of economic, socioeconomic groups, etc. And often people who move can sort of recreate their lives in this new, new environment. You've had, again, an amazing career so far. And I'm looking at one particular assignment you had in Kenya and Uganda, where you were responsible for 45 projects and close to $7 billion of resources. And, you know, you were supervising something like 40 people. And I'm just wanting to sort of go along with you on this trip to this assignment back in September 2014, when you were told that you're the person, you're going to be the program leader here. What 
starts to go through your mind as you take on these assignments? And when you hit the ground, what are some of the first things you're looking to do? Take us with you. Yeah, so the program leader role, you know, at the World Bank, that was the that was the first time that role had been created. So nobody had done it in that way before. So I didn't really know what to expect. And uh, and so when I was given this assignment, I said, okay, what am I? What is my first thing to do? Is I the job was to be a coordinator for you know this very very large program. And we have, you know, a lot of very talented people. There are people on the ground who know some of this work, you know, better than I do. So my first thing was to say, okay, you know, what is my role in this in this job? And my role there is to really support the team that I have on the ground. It's really to also be responsive to the demands that our our counterparts are, the you know, people of Kenya or Uganda, what are their needs and how is it that I can support our team better respond to what's needed there? So that was like the first thing that went to my mind. And then the second thing is that you're, you're moving. I was living here in DC. So it's moving to Kenya and what would be, what would it be like to live in a new place where I had, you know, left my family and friends and so forth behind. So, you know, there's that element, but also the excitement of, discovering new countries. You know, I've never been to Uganda or Rwanda before. So there's that element of getting to know people, getting to know new customs, and also really understanding what it is that a country, what are the challenges that a country faces and what can we do as an institution to help bring about change and and partnership. You know, those are the things that went through my mind. And when you got there, what did you discover? Oh, gosh, so many wonderful things. I mean, Kenya is an amazingly dynamic place. The level of ingenuity and creativity there is is, is really incredible. I discovered M-Pesa there, which is the use of mobile money that we did not even have here. And, it, and I was like, what, what is M-Pesa? You know, people use mobile money to buy goods, to pay for services, to borrow money. And I saw how this technological invention that was, you know, so Kenyan provided access to the unbanked in a way is, uh, that I hadn't seen before. And there's so many just creative, creative people. So that was the first thing that, that struck me. And, and it's also a very, very beautiful country. The weather is amazing. I started doing a lot of long distance running there. So I ran a few half marathons, couldn't keep up with the Kenyan runners, but, but I got to the end. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's nothing wrong with trying. So you get there and you have this really big job to do in three different countries. As I said, you know, many projects underway, a team that you're managing. What did you see as some of the biggest hurdles that you had to climb over in order to be successful? Well, my job was, I was a coordinator. So so the influence I could have was more softer. So I, it was not like you're uh, leading by authority, but like re- leading by, uh, what's the word? By persuasion, influence. by persuasion, right? Yeah. 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 And yeah. so it's like learning that skill. And so really being attentive, trying to list, because, um, often there are also people who wanted different things and trying to make sure that you're able to reconcile differences and sort of play the role of an intermediary between you know various team members and also managing demands that were coming from different angles that and and sometimes we were not able to fulfill those demands right and so it's learning how to how to be diplomatic get things done bring people together so what were some of your teammates doing who were actually working along with you, the ones who were working on these projects? I think that one of the most exciting programs that we had was working in informal settlements. And this is something that I've been very passionate about, urban poverty. So we had a program called the Kenya Informal Settlements Program, which basically went into some of the poorest neighborhoods that you could, you probably ever seen where people did not have basic services, where they did not have say toilets, you know, some of the basic things that here in the U.S. you might think is just part of a, a person's right. You know, people didn't have those things. And so our program went in and provided 
those services. We provided access roads because in a place like that, if you had, say, a, a fire, you had no way of getting in a, a fire truck and rescue people. And people had very limited ways of, because, you know, the way that the neighborhoods were built, there was like not clear roads, the rights of ways were not established. So we basically reorganized the whole area so that there's proper streets, there's proper drainage in the event of rains and people are not going to get flooded, water and sanitation services. And then people do not have land titles. And if they don't have land titles, they're not able to improve their own houses. So we helped get them their land rights so that they could improve their own housing. So it was dramatic, the impact that we were able to have in transforming those neighborhoods. And the most important thing is also to make sure that people you know, live in dignity, but also are able to improve their own livelihoods because they live in a in a more decent, you know, environment. And then they're, I mean, the reason they lived in those neighborhoods is also because they were very close to their places of employment. And so you had just this ripple effect of being able to improve both living conditions, but also improve the overall economic development of the, just not, not just the neighborhood, but the whole city. And we're also able to bring in some innovation. One of the things that we did was people who live in poor neighborhoods and have access to, say, water. One of the big challenges is that you get your water bill maybe once every six weeks, but people are paid day to day. And so they're not, you're not, you don't have a predictable, say, monthly salary. So it's very hard to know what your income is so that you can pay off your, your water bill. We devise the system working with water authority there where people can actually pay their water consumption as they as they consume it, so as they receive money. So you have and and it's using this mobile app and um, and PESA facility. And and basically if you have money this this week you pay you pay off what bill you owed in that week. But at the end of the month you you paid the whole bill off. So that had a huge impact both in en- enabling the water utility to get paid and people to also have the resources to pay. Because before what was happening is that people were just not able to pay and they just wouldn't pay, you know. So at the end, everybody sort of lost. Meski, how did you manage the sustainable part of your work that involved making sure that people were actually engaged in their development? I would suspect that there is a a need to make sure that whatever work you do is in fact work that people want and feel a part of if it's going to be sustainable. How do you go about engaging the people that you're actually helping in the improvement in their Mm -hmm. environments Mm -hmm. and communities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question because citizen engagement is actually one of our core, as a World Bank, that's one of our core values. And each of our projects has to demonstrate we have ways for engaging communities and that's actually part of our how we measure progress on a on a project so in in Kenya um, well actually not just in Kenya but you know we've done this in, in Rwanda and Uganda when I worked there we do it throughout so I'm just citing those as, as examples is that during the consultation process when we're working with our various counterparts on on designing a, a program of assistance, we have various fora where the ideas behind the project are tested against the communities that will be benefiting from the intervention. And their feedback is then, it is integrated into the way in which the project is is designed. And in some cases, for example, you might have to acquire land to expand a road, for example, or put in, build a school, you might need to acquire land. When that happens, people who are affected in that immediate vicinity are consulted. If they need to be compensated, there's compensation processes are you know put in place. But that is done in in discussion with those communities to make sure that their lives are continually made better than when before the intervention took place. So we did a lot of a lot of community outreach 
at all different levels. And sometimes it happens in a more formalized way by working with associations, not-for-profit organizations like like yours. Through, we worked with networks, and sometimes it's with community leaders. Um, so it would depend a lot on the type of program. But in each way, we try to identify the most important community-level interlocutors. And once the program is under implementation, then we also try to make sure we have a way for getting beneficiary feedback. So we would do surveys and see how people are feeling about the intervention. How would you say you're scored in those feedbacks? Well, it depends on the project, right? So <laughs> <laughs> people are not always happy, you know, to be but for, well, yeah. of course, they're not always happy, and I, and I appreciate that. But I'm more interested in knowing, because obviously you've had a lot of success too. But I'm more interested in knowing: are there things that seem to be points that people bring up that are just hard to support them in? Maybe there are things that they seem to consistently cite that try as you might, it's just hard to achieve success in that area. There's always kind of a tension between expectations mm-hmm. and uh, what's possible to to achieve and and really working with the community to ensure communication helps to achieve kind of a more measured level of expectation and that's what I find is often a a big a big challenge because people expect one thing and then they're getting another and often it's because the communication hasn't been effective and so and then by communication there has to be multiple channels and often it's like opinion leaders you know they could be church leaders or local imams or or opinion leaders in the city environment it could be you know academics or or they're just sort of trusted voices and making sure that we're always able to create fora so that those ideas actually percolate up and that we're able to to engage opinion leaders. Often when that's not there, you could have a lot of misunderstanding and then mismatched expectations and frustrations. Sounds like you're talking about yeah. the United <laughs> States. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we have organizations that are trying to do work and then we have activists out there that are sometimes critical of the organizations because they're not moving fast enough. So And we have government that uh, people sometimes feel moves too slowly. And so it's in that sense, you know, really no different. And yet the context is probably quite different. And so it's just interesting. I, I just run across a lot of young people who are very intrigued and interested in working abroad. Many of them will go to schools where they can get degrees in advanced studies to support this interest that they have in working overseas. And I tell them, you know, make sure you manage your own expectations because it's going to take a while for you to get the kind of change that you want. And you're not necessarily there to be anybody's (laughs) savior. (laughs) You know, you're there to contribute in any way that you can that matches what the people really need and what they want. And I think maybe, is that the right orientation to have when you, when you take on this work? Yes, for, for sure. I think for, for a young person, what I, uh, you know, I also get that question a lot is, is I say that you really have to think about what it is that you think you can, you can bring to a, a community or a country or you want to do international work, but really do you have the right, the right skills? Do you speak the language? Often, like I think language is a really, really critical skill because unless you have that, you really will not be able to communicate and then there's a limit to what you can do, you know? And um, and if you're working mm-hmm. in development, it's I also feel like a lot of people don't fully appreciate the skills and the knowledge that people in developing countries actually have, you know, sometimes there could be a savior mentality that I find is very, is very short-sighted and does not have enough appreciation of the communities and the constraints that people in those countries are, are facing. So we should be trying to create opportunities that help enable, unleash 
those existing skills rather than coming in and saying, oh, I'm going to do this for you. Yeah. And all that said, none of that obviously has deterred you. You've jumped right in and, and found it to be just right for you. Why would that be an accurate statement? Well, I mean, for me, I really love learning about other cultures. I always approached it as a process of of learning and it's an exchange, right? I have something to offer and I always feel like I I learn and I gain so much more from the people that I'm, you know, working with as having that that, you know, attitude really helps a lot. I started, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, my career doing field work in, in Mauritania and and I learned a lot because most of the people that I interacted with there were, you know, they couldn't read or write, but I could see how much they held their communities together. So there's like a lot of lessons to be learned there. Spent, you know, many years working in, in Palestine. And that was one of the places where I actually did a lot of work with NGOs and saw how communities can organize and when they organize and really respond to the needs of their of their constituents can really be transformative, both in terms of the types of livelihood improvements that they can do, but also in the advocacy so that the outside world has a better understanding of the experiences that they're going through. Meski, a lot of the work you've done over the last 10 years, in fact, most of it has been done on the auspices of the World Bank, a fascinating institution I wish you would just share with us a primer on what the World Bank is and what its objectives are and how it goes about them. So the World Bank is a multilateral financial institution, and um, our mission is to reduce poverty around the world. And we are a membership-based organization, so most of the nations in the world are members, member countries, and countries that are poor have a different, have a very low interest rate credit to which we offer, you know, financial either grants or credits. And countries that have, are say, at the middle income status are able to borrow funds at terms that are favorable. And that comes with advice that we provide on different types of developmental themes. So essentially, we lend funding for developmental interventions that have an impact on poverty. And we provide the technical advice to help kind of meet those objectives. So are these generally loans? I would suspect that these countries are able to take out loans, which is obviously a tremendous resource if you don't have currency to take on an infrastructure project or to build schools or to build places where people can can get health care. Tremendous resource. And I can see, therefore, given that it is a bank, banks generally like to be paid back for their loans why the work you do is so important to also assure that the countries that are borrowing these funds are someday in a position to repay them. Yeah. So it depends on the, the poverty level. So some countries actually get grants because their financial situation and some of those countries get very, very, very low interest rates. So when you look at it over the life of the loan, it's as if the, interest rate wasn't wasn't there so they're getting it at concessional rates so it's very advantageous from that point of view but i think the main reason that we have countries want to work with us is because of the advice that we provide that accompanies their developmental intervention it's also we have a big we play a big convening role by bringing in other developmental partners and now we're also working more and more with the private sector because the amount of resources that countries need is so, especially in the poor countries, are so significant that we can help to bring, convene different stakeholders so that they could get a bigger 
response for their needs. I was just going to ask you about the the whole idea that somehow there are these poor countries, but I don't know how you would define poor from in economic terms. And I want our listeners to really understand what we're talking about when we say a poor country. So there are countries, like, for example, that are facing conflict and have a tremendous amount of constraints. Like if you take, say, South Sudan or, or Somalia, you know, countries like that, that, that are they're facing situations of uh, fragility. So those countries, mm-hmm. because I, I use, as you said, you know, the, the loan has to be paid by the citizens, but we, those countries are still in a, situ- in a very precarious situation. So what you want to do is make sure that they have the developmental interventions for like education and, and, and health and some basic services that their citizens have access to so that they can start to rebuild. And those kinds of countries get grants because you don't want to create an impoverishing situation when they're already in a fragile place. I guess what I'm trying to understand is when you determine poverty, what is the financial metric? Is it per capita income? It's the GDP, yeah. It's the GDP of the nation. So if you were to compare a poor country to, let's say, a developed country, what's the disparity between the two in terms of GDP? Well, the measure for extreme poverty is a dollar ninety, so it's less than two dollars a day. Whereas if you compare it to the equivalent in the U.S., it'll be around two hundred dollars a day. So you can see the disparity between the two. Yeah, so that gives people some sense of of mm-hmm. the level of poverty that we're really talking about here. We're not just talking yeah. about you know people who have painfully been unemployed for a month or so, which is a really horrible thing in this country. But imagine living with a dollar ninety cents a day income. You can't do much of anything with a dollar ninety cents a day. And then you would have a family, you know, a family of six, seven that you're supporting. Yeah. You can't get any health care. You can't get any education. There's there's no way you can even think about building any type of economic infrastructure, the business of any kind. Clothing, I don't even know where that comes from. Housing. There's so much that people in these environments need that it's bewildering. And, you know, yet you're able to come in and at least put some type of plan together along with them to help them go from where they are to a bit more viability. I just think that's very impressive. And I want to just ask you, does your work ever get depressing in any way, seeing this, in some cases, misery, uh, at least in our terms, that you obviously experience when you're in these countries sometimes? You're stuck, like you said, you know, then some some places there's very deep poverty. Like if I think of, I mean, ideally, if you look at housing, for example, affordable housing, the good rate to think about is about 30% of your income should be going to affordable housing. And then the rest is you have money for other kinds of expenses, including entertainment, et cetera, here in the U.S. And then maybe you spend 10% of your income on, say, transportation. But in most developing countries, we did a study in Kenya, like about 40% of the income would go to transport. So that's just for you to, you know, going from point A to point B to get your to earn an income, you know, 40% you're spending on just transportation. So, yeah, so that when you hear things like that and, and you see poverty, it's, it's, it's striking and it, it's, it's depressing, but I'm more uplifted by the possibility of change and the change that I see on, and the impact of the programs that we have on, on the poor, knowing that people's living conditions are are improved. Sure. So if I got depressed I wouldn't I wouldn't do yeah, it. Yeah, I could I could imagine yeah. that. And thanks for your optimism and for your perseverance to continue the work despite, you know, some real challenges that you obviously see on a daily basis. 
I had a previous guest on a few months ago who was a former ambassador to Tanzania. He was also the former head of acting director of the United States Agency for International Development. And during the interview, we talked a bit about what he had to do, not only him, but what we have to do as Americans sometimes to convince our fellow countrymen and women that these are the right kinds of investments to be making. There is a, I guess, position that some people have that we should focus on the needs that we have at home and not worry so much about what happens abroad. Obviously, that's not how you see it. What argument would you make to people who don't quite get it, who don't quite understand why we would invest in people halfway around the world who will never see, never know, never interact with? Well, they will anyway. They'll never know. Well, I think, uh, first of all, the world is a very, very interconnected place just because you don't believe like you're your corner of the world it doesn't mean that that part of the world isn't a part of you so and we're all interconnected by virtue of you know our, our cultures we have shared cultures i think that's an important feature i mean the us in and africa is intimately connected since i mean this country was built by by africans we have to recognize that so there is a historical debt in some ways that has to be sort of reckoned with, there is the contribution that Africans have made to, um, even even now, I mean, I'm talking about even a a big community of African immigrants that are contributing to building America like today. So it's not, it's not just something that has happened in the past, but continues to happen today. So there is that, that connection. The other part is there's a lot of knowledge to be gained from knowing what people in different part of the world are are um, are doing, so a lot of the technological advances that we've got here, like I mentioned the Mpesa, I mean that's something that could serve us here in in the U.S. You know, there's a lot of there's trade, of course. There are cell phones. I mean, they all have rare earth minerals in them, and those come from the from the DRC. Mm-hmm. People who are married have diamond rings, and, they, mm-hmm. and those come from from Africa. So we have the, an economic link, whether we want it or not. So if we do, why don't we try to make sure that the benefits that we are accruing here are also accruing to people there, and it's not done in a exploitative manner. You know, every cup of coffee we drink this morning, or we drink every morning, comes from the developing world as does the cocoa that we eat in our chocolate, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so we are, we are interconnected whether we like it or not, but we have to do it in a way that is not, that brings just economic justice. I think that's another element of it. Sure. Uh, Mesky. So as we begin to wind this interview down, I want to just get a sense from you about what we might see 10, 15, 20, 25 years from now on the continent of Africa, where you've spent so much time. I hear many people who I consider to be futurists believing that this is a time for Africa to rise, that the elements of future productivity are all in place for Africa to grow and to thrive. I just would be curious if you see it that way and are there barriers that we need to make sure that we keep down in order for that prognostication to come true? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i very optimistic about Africa's as future and what I see is a lot of the countries around the region are showing, you know, a lot of progress, both if you look at most of the countries, actually, it's a very young population, it's a very young uh, region. So there's a, a, there's the untapped creativity of youth that we see. And if you look at in the creative industries, for for example, there's just a tremendous amount of 
talent that we're already seeing for like in the music and, and, and fashion that really hasn't made it into, I mean, we haven't really seen it here in America, but a lot of, if you look, go to Europe, people are really tapping into the, the, the creativity of young Africans. What we've seen in the past year is that you don't need to be in a, in a classroom to learn and access to the internet is actually changing the way in which kids learn all over the world. And what we're seeing is in you know a lot of places in Africa and in Nigeria and Kenya and Ghana and other places that have very good internet penetration, especially through Wi-Fi access, that young people are now able to create you know applications. I know young man in Kenya that created an app for selling goats, like an auctioning them uh, through an app that he designed, and and he was selling it to to like one one person in Bangladesh and another person in Nepal were using his app to exchange, <laughs> to, to, to sell their, wow. their cattle, you know, wow. things like that. You know, so there's a lot of creativity that is emerging out of the, out of the continent that is making it into the global network of not just information sharing, but actually development kind of construction. Mm-hmm. So, so that that gives me that gives me hope, and I said, as I said, it's also a young population, and so that's where the creativity is uh, is rising. And I see a lot of people from the diaspora are also starting to to go back and see opportunities for creating. It's sort of like the new new frontier. Well, I um, am very optimistic too, and I am even more so optimistic because there are people like you who are out there on the ground making it so. And I just want to thank you for that. And thank you too, for being my guest today on the Heart of Giving podcast. It's it's a real treat to to have you join me today and hear your story and your work. And I know our listeners will feel the same way. So, and continue, you know, continue what you're doing. Let me be an encouraging uh, figure. And Maybe we can also create a whole new cadre of people like you who follow in your footsteps. I know I'm going to send a lot of people your way who tell me they have interest in going to uh, to work in Africa and other places around the world. So thank you for this new friendship and for everything that you've done. This is the Heart of Giving podcast. I'm Art Taylor. You can find other episodes on all major podcast platforms. I hope you'll listen then, and I thank you for listening now. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. Send your comments and ideas to Nona at thusmarket.com. That's Nona at thusmarket.com. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.